Hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me. And despite the fact that unfortunately the meeting had to be cancelled due to the coronavirus, for making the talk uh, still happen. So thank huge thanks for this. My talk will be about uh, the reverse mathematics of Heinemann's theorem. And it's a joint work with Ludovic Paté and Benoit Monin toward finding uh, an arithmetical solution to Heinemann's theorem. So what is Heinemann's theorem? Um, if A is a subset of the integers, then we write fs of A and call finite sums of A the set of finite sums of elements of distinct elements taken from A. The fact that those are distinct elements is important. In particular, it implies that fs of A is not always closed under finite sum. For instance, the finite sums of the singleton 1 and the integer equal to 0 mod 3, as 1 can only be taken once in a sum, does not yield uh, a set that is closed under finite sum. And what does Heidemann's theorem say? It says that if we color the integer into finitely many colors, then one of the colors will contain the finite sum of an infinite set. So it's a strong it's stronger than uh, the pigeon or principle. Not only one of the color is infinite, but also it contains an infinite set and all the finite sum of this infinite set. So a few simple examples. So first, the simplest coloring, the even and odd integer. We cannot have a solution containing odd integers because the sum of two odd is even. But the set of even integer is a solution. A finite sum of even integer is even. The mod 3 coloring is basically the same reasoning, and we have a solution consisting of the zero mod 3 elements. A uh, bit different is the coloring given by the parity of the length of the binary expansion. So this coloring has blocks of elements of the same color of increasing uh, length. So using this, we can build a solution by taking the first of each block as the blocks grow exponentially uh, uh, in, in largeness. So for instance, 64 is the beginning of a very large block, sufficiently large so that adding 64 uh, to the sum of all the previous things that are taken stay inside the interval of red um, elements which makes uh, the finite sum of the green uh, things always red. OK, but now we want a more general formulation. And throughout this, we need uh, two definitions, the one of IP set and of partition regularity. First, an IP set is a subset of the integers that contains the, the finite sum of an infinite set, S. The largest set, the biggest set n, is an IP set because it contains uh, the finite sums of elements from itself. But if we take a finite set, it cannot be uh, an IP set. If A is an IP set and B contains A, then B is also an IP set. So it's closed under superset, which gives it a flavor of uh, already of largeness because. The largest set is inside and it is closed under the super set. Second definition is the one of partition regularity, uh, where we say that a class this time, so a subset of the set of integers, um, is partition regular. So if every element of the class that is partitioned into finitely many parts will have one of its parts in the class. It also is a property of largeness notion because if we read it as, if we see the class as containing large set, it says that if a large set is partitioned into finitely many pieces, then one piece is large, which makes sense for a largeness notion. And what Heinemann said is that the IP set form a partition regular class. Unfolding the definition, we have that if Starting from an IPC set A and 
partitioning it into finitely many pieces, one of the pieces is an IP set. This new formulation has several advantages. So first, it reveals the Ramseyan statement of uh, Heidemann, that is, every recurring of a, of a structure, in this case, the IP set, uh, there is a monochromatic substructure. But also, this allows to iterate Heidemann's theorem, which was not easy in uh, the first formulation. Note that the two formulations are in, in equivalent, and one can prove each other from the other, but not so easily. It has to be done to some work. Okay, so what do we know about the state of the art of uh, the reverse mathematics and the computable content of Heinemann's theorem? First, the upper bound is that uh, to get a, a coloring, to get a solution to a specific coloring, uh, Omega plus one jump surface surfaces, so there is always a monochromatic IP set that is computable in the omega plus one string jump of C, which uh, which yields that uh, Hinman's theorem is provable in ACN not plus, which is ACN not with the existence of the omega string jump of any set. In terms of flower bound, we have that uh, there exists a computable coring such that all uh, homogeneous, all solution compute zero prime. So we need at least the existence of zero prime to prove um, Heinemann's theorem. And also there is one with no sigma two solution. So where zero prime is not enough to show that, uh, uh, to, to find the solution. This yells, the, so the first part and the first theorem is due to Blast, Just, and Simpson, while the no sigma 2 solution is due to Henry Tausner. As a corollary, uh, at least this yells that Hidman's theorem proves ACN see And uh, these two lower and upper bounds uh, still leaves a huge gap between, uh, the, between them. So, what is the uh, strict bound. That is, we now know that uh, omega plus one jumps compute a monochromatic IP set, but zero prime might not surface. Uh, so the question is, what is the exact alpha so that alpha jump uh, is enough to compute a monochromatic IP set, but for any smaller beta, uh, it, it doesn't surface. And in terms of reverse mathematics, uh, the question can be asked as, is it provable in AC or not? Or can, does Heinemann's theorem prove AC or not plus, or is it strictly in between? The first two cases cor roughly corresponds to whether alpha is finite or infinite. And the second case is just because we are in proof theory, we might a uh, lack of induction. Okay, so the work we have done with uh, Ludovic and Benoit was to was uh, mainly focused on trying to prove that uh, there exists um, a an arithmetical solution to Heinemann's theorem. And in order to show you this, uh, I need to uh, give a glimpse of the proof of Heinemann's theorem. What first? What will be the more naive and uh, of proof of Heinemann's theorem, it will be a kind of greedy algorithm where we start with uh, an element, see what elements are compatible with it. That is, it is for the, in this case, it is blue, but also when added uh, with two, it is still blue. So for instance, four when added with two is still blue, but um, 15, when we add two to 15, it yields a red element. So we take the first compatible element and if there are still some compatibles that are compatible with both the, two, the previous ones, um, we take it and we continue like this. However, as you can see, maybe this greedy algorithm will 
not be able to find the next element at some point. For instance, if there is only red element af, uh, at some level, uh, then it was doomed uh, right at the start. And this is not the only case where it can be doomed. For instance, against uh, even an odd uh, coloring, even though the odd integers are infinite, we take one and we are already uh, we cannot continue. So what can this uh, coloring, uh, so this algorithm, how can it be improved to to work? to be able to never uh, be stuck. The strategy is to define a largeness notion so that we can prove those two things, one and two. So one is the large set from a partition regular class. That is, if we have a large uh, set colored into finitely many color, one of the color is large. And A is large implies we can find an element of A so that the things that are compatible with n in A is still large. Okay, given this, so we apply one to say that one color is large. Let's say it's blue. And from the fact that blue is large, we apply two to find some element, for instance five, so that um, the things that are compatible with five is large. And then we apply two again to find another element in the compatible ones, so that the things that are compatible with five and also compatible with 65 is large. And because it's large, we can apply two again and continue like this. We know we will never be stuck because we will always be able to apply two. So this is how we prove Heinemann's theorem from a largeness notion satisfying one and two. But what can be those uh, uh, largeness notion? What can be such a largeness notion? So first, the failing candidate. So we cannot take just large being infinite because two will not be satisfied as we already have seen it with the uh, odd integer and the odd and even coloring. The uh, odd color is uh, infinite. However, we cannot uh, take an odd number so that this number plus the odd numbers is, um, is uh, large because it's always the empty set. So in particular, a large set must be an IP set. Uh, because we, by iterating one and two, uh, from any large set, by iterating two, we, we build a, uh, an IP set inside it, so it must be an IP set. If we take uh, largeness to be uh, just the fact of being an IP set, then proving one is equivalent to proving Heinemann's term. So we did not make any progress. We need to design a largeness notion that is expressed in a different way of being an IP set. Okay. So let me now give you an example of largest notions that work. Um, the first one is uh, using ultra filter. And an idempotent ultra filter is an ultra filter u so that u is equal to u plus u, where u plus u is uh, this formula. Uh, it satisfies this formula, it's defined by this. And Galvin and Glazer proved that. Uh, uh, they used idempotent ultra filter to prove Hillman's theorem. Indeed, we have that idempotent ultra filter satisfies one and two. The first one is point is just being an ultra filter, and the second one is very easy to prove from the definition of uh, an idempotent ultra filter. The remaining uh, thing needed to prove Heinemann's theorem is just to prove the existence of a non principal idempotent ultra filter, which is a step that is not so difficult but still uh, uh, has to be done and, of course, uh, needs the axiom of choice. The second uh, definition of Fergus's work is due to Baumgartner. So if i is an IP set, 
we will say that the set A is large in I if we cannot shrink I into I prime uh, in a way that we avoid A. That is, uh, A is unavoidable by shrinking A prime. And then we say that it is B large if it is large in some IP set. And Baumgartner proved 1.1 uh, and 0.2 for this notion of B large, B for Baumgartner. Okay. So what we can remark is that uh, B largeness from what Baumgartner proved is the same as being an IP set. Indeed, a B large set, inside a B large set, by the, the construction of iterating 2, uh, we can find an IP set inside. Uh, so, B largeness implies being an IP set, and an IP set is always uh, large in itself, and therefore B large. So, those two notions, they were expressed differently, but they are the same notion. Okay. Now, we are interested in effectivizing the proof. Um, so, the proof was by iterating 2. And the problem is that in 2, we find an n. We know that there exists an n and we pick one. But it is uh, in a non-uniform way. We do it omega many times and we pick n out of fine infinitely many uh, candidates. So this is uh, highly non-effective. However, we can consider 2 prime to be uh, a weaker statement, saying that if A is large, then we can find finitely many uh, candidates, N, inside A, so that the union of the, the thing, so the union of the thing of the integers that are compatible with one of them is large. So it's a weaker statement to prove. However, uh, using 1, we are able to recover 2 uh, from 2 prime. So from 2 prime, we know that uh, there are finitely many candidates, but such that this is large. But then by partition regularity, one of the parts, that is one of the candidates, is enough for, it, for the set to be large. OK. Um, so now the proof is done not by iterating 2, but by iterating 1 and 2 prime. And this time, uh, the n found by 1 is still in a non-uniform way, but out of finitely many candidates. And this makes it much easier to, to, uh, to find. And how we do it is to postpone the choice of the n to the end of the construction to apply only once a uh, weak Koenig's lemma. And in the meantime, we split the construction for every uh, candidate, which is what we will uh, do here. So how to avoid the use of 1 in the proof, supposing 2 prime? Recall what is 2 prime. 2 prime is that uh, we can find uh, finitely many elements, so for instance two candidates, so that the things that are compatible with one of the two candidates is uh, large. So here the white points are those that are large. And then we can split the construction. So th the union of all those um, elements is large. And each element is compatible with one of them, so either the blue, either the red, but it could, it could be the same color. And um, because we know that one is true, we know that either this, the red ones are large or the blue ones are large. But we don't know which one, and this is what we, why we split the construction and continue the construction inside both uh, possibilities. Okay, this is the exactly what the combinatorial object of a full match. So a full match is uh, two things. First, a large 
uh, set that is an IP set in this case. S is an IP set. S will correspond to the set of red and blue things that we keep in the construction. Um, and F is a finite set so that for any element of the large set, there is one A in the finite set that is compatible with X. Okay, this is exactly what we did. And uh, a full match yield uh, splitting, of a partitioning of, of uh, S into finitely many parts, one of them will be large. So from the definition of a full match, we are able to iterate it. So we start uh, with everything. We do the construction of a full match and do the full match again to split inside the sub-construction into sub-sub-construction. We continue like this. We know that uh, we will always be able to do a full match, to find a full match, and then, and then, and therefore to continue uh, the construction in some of the sub-constructions and in the end we apply weak Koenig's lemma to find a, an infinite pass and this infinite pass will yield the good choice of the candidate inside the finitely many possible candidates okay um, I, I think it is now clear that understanding the complexity of a full match is essential to understand the complexity of a solution to Heinemann's theorem. Finding when, when a, an infinite finitary branching tree is built, finding um, a path in the tree is uh, arithmetical and is not so difficult. Uh, so it remains to build the tree. And building the tree is just uh, iterating uh, the construction of a full match. If finding a full match is easy, the tree will not be difficult to uh, to build. Okay, so again the definition of a full match. The question is now whether we the complexity of a full match is the lowest one, that is we can always find a computable full match given a computable coloring. If we, if this is the case, then uh, the tree is, uh, uh, even if it is not uniformly the case, the tree is arithmetical because we can always use some iteration of the jump to find the either index uh, giving the computable full match. And, uh, and then use this, and then continue to build the the, the, the tree. Uh, however, a negative answer to this question was published with an error in the proof. And so we found the error, and which opened again the possibility of having a computable full match. And this object, we need to know. We don't know re yet nothing uh, of its computability. So we are really interested in knowing the reverse mathematics of uh, the full match. Um, so for the, the, the proof of the existence of a full match, which yields an arithmetical full match, uh, is uh, very similar to Heinemann's theorem, uh, however with uh, right matches. So the right matches are an, another combinatorial object that take the place of a full match in the proof of a full match. So what is a right match? A right match is just a weakening of a full match where we don't require A and X to be fully compatible, but only compatible, weakly compatible in the sense that C of X and C of, so a, X and A plus X have the same color. So it's a weakening and what about the um, computable content of the existence of right matches? Tosner proved that uh, there is always, uh, given a computable coring, there is always a computable right match. Uh, so we have one, we have one uh, weakening of uh, full matches, which always admits computable 
uh, solution. What about the other weakening? Because we have three uh, equalities. There is another weakening, which we define to be left matches. So left matches are the other weakening of full matches. They do not appear anywhere in the proof that in of Heinemann's theorem. But it's interesting to uh, study its computable content. So this time, uh, X and A are weakly compatible if C of A is equal to C of A plus X. With uh, Benoit, uh, Ludovic, and I, we proved that uh, for this notion of left matches, there always exists a computable left match, given a computable coloring uh, with two colors. And this is important, uh, the fact that we use only two colors. For full matches, it does not depend on the number of colors. The statement for two colors implies the statement for n colors. However, it is not the case, it is unknown for left matches. So there is uh, still a question uh, for three coloring. So I recall the question for full matches, and I ask the new question also for left matches. The second question should be easier to answer than the first one because the first one implies the second one. Finally, we uh, were able, so using the same kind of disjunction that we used to prove the fact that a uh, left match for uh, two coloring alway can always be taken uh, computab computable. Um, we could prove that there, there are computable full matches for many coloring and especially for all the coloring that we that were used to prove um, uh, lower bounds to Heinemann's theorem. So we have this uh, formula and for many cases, depending on the truth value of this, we are able to find a computable full match. And what does this tell us is also that the coloring, if, if there is a coloring that does not admit a computable full match, then this coloring um, must be uh, not symmetric in uh, the two colors and uh, probably highly non symmetric. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention.